Not even one year ago, I was a resident. Now there's a TV show called The Resident. Let's get started. It is true surgeons play their favorite music. Oh, yank that sucker. It's when they're are, uh, operating. Did you guys know this is my first surgery with Dr. Bell? No kidding. We have to get a photo. Make it quick. Kitty and shoot. Okay. No, no one's taking out their cell phone in the middle of an operation and taking selfies. I wish we could do one without the mask. Quick, let uh -oh. me Tremor? Just one more. I think we're good. I'm going to send this to my mother. You get us all fired. Camera's on cloud. I was waking up. I need to up the seal. Oh. 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 oh my god. You hit an artery on an appendectomy? You're losing blood fast. Hey, two liters of normal saline wide open. Call for four units of blood and two FFP stack. And give them to Delenberg. He's breathing very heavily. Rightfully so. I have something. He's lost at least two liters already. Come on, come on. What splattered on him, maybe a quarter of a liter. Two liters is a lot of blood, and that's probably not two liters. He has some shaky hands, may have hit an artery. When you hit an artery, it does splash like that. The first step during a surgery is to get one of the tools called the hemostat, and basically it clamps off the artery to get it to stop bleeding. CPR is gonna put all that blood back into his body. Whoa. Die on me. Oh, Epi? Yes. I'm assuming this is someone's bad dream because they're not following proper protocol. I have no idea why he's stopping CPR. Nothing makes sense here. He is so dead. Time of death. Okay, okay. <laughs> Whoa. You guys told me The Resident is the most accurate medical show on television so far. This has been incredibly inaccurate. This gentleman's heart stopped in the middle of the procedure because he was losing blood. They were supposed to get blood and start the blood flow through an IV. They started chest compressions. They didn't follow uh, the cardiac life support algorithm of giving epinephrine, rechecking the rhythm after two minutes. And it looks like they called the time of death after 30 seconds. Well, I think we can all agree it was the misdose SIVO. What? Let this unfortunate situation. You're kidding, right? The patient woke up, his arm hit my hand. You left the blade in the field. You nicked the artery. Well, you, you never should have located him for surgery in the first place. His INR was abnormal. The upper range of normal. That's you, never gonna you fly. Know, I'm, I'm... We're all on the same team here, right? <laughs> oh my God. He's trying to blame it on the patient coming in with a high INR, which is basically the ability of the patient, the inability of a patient to, to clot properly. So if you have a very high INR, you're more likely to bleed out. If this happened, I hope that the people around me uh, have the courage to speak up and say something about it. In fact, one of the biggest initiatives that have been going on in hospitals over the last 10 to 20 years is to give nurses uh, the voice and the courage to speak up when they see doctors, especially senior doctors like this gentleman who's a chief of surgery, who's been practicing for 30 years, to speak up and say, no, you've made a mistake and we need to own up to it and figure out what went wrong and how we can prevent this in the future. This is awful. This is an awful situation. I have goosebumps, honestly. We have 206 bones and I can name each one. <laughs> it's a very cheesy way to uh, turn somebody on. Everything you thought you knew about medicine is wrong. All the rules you followed will break. I have only one rule, covers everything. I'm never wrong. You do whatever the hell I tell you, no questions asked. I can't take this guy seriously. He sounds like he's from a Western movie. And he's like, welcome to the wild, wild west. Yes, in reality, medical school is quite different from life as a resident. There's a lot that you think you know about working in a hospital when in reality you start working in a residency, you realize that you didn't know or what you thought you knew was actually wrong and you practice it in a different way. That's why those who get overly confident by regurgitating facts and figures really have their minds blown when they enter the hospital and they see the way medicine is practiced because humans are very complex. They don't present like the way the textbooks says they will present. 
They don't always give you a clear indication of what's wrong with them. It's a lot more of a puzzle and figuring out what's going on. The heart of what he's saying is true. The way he's presenting it is way overblown and dramatic. My last resident had an attitude too, and you know where he is now? He's teaching eighth grade biology. <laughs> I cut him. Do you know what that means? It means I can end your career just like that remove you from this residency at any time for any reason, and if I do that, no other residency will take you. Completely untrue. Senior residents don't have the ability to get you kicked out unless you do something just horribly wrong. And if you lose your spot in a residency because you disagree with a senior resident, it doesn't mean that no other residencies will touch you. Again, a completely overblown statement and untrue, I guess, for the dramatic factor of the show. This is Dobroslav. He's Croatian, speaks no English. He has severe cauda equina syndrome. What are we worried about? Early paralysis. Hey man, what's the first sign of paralysis? Anal tone. Stick your finger up his ass. <laughs> normal procedure is to get an MRI. Well, thank you so much for telling me about normal procedure. Cauda equina syndrome is where you have severe narrowing of the area of the spinal cord where your nerves travel through. So you lose a sensation of your lower limbs. You lose the ability to have proper anal tone. Some people have incontinence where they just past their, uh, their bowels, they lose urinary control and just have urinary incontinence, meaning that they pee themselves. And if any of those things happen, you have to call 911 because cauda equina, this procedure, this condition that they're talking about, is a medical emergency. Obviously, one of the ways to test that is to do a rectal exam and check the sphincter tone, but he's being really rude about it. <laughs> Good afternoon. We need to explore your rectum. Back in the day, we used to have translators that lived in the hospital, I mean, worked in the hospital. Now we have really good intercom systems. Some hospitals even have iPads that connect you to another person who can be the functioning translator. The correct way to do this is to not talk to the translator and have them translate it, but talk to the patient normally and have the translator somewhere behind you or on the phone talking to them, translating. So you're still having a conversation with the patient, not a conversation with the translator. That's a very important distinction to make. I was hoping this show wouldn't involve sex, but I'm striking out week by week because apparently everyone's in love in the hospital. Maybe I've just worked in the wrong hospitals. Keep leukemic on chemo, fiance caught because she was shaking uncontrollably. Uh, she spiked the fever this morning, 100.8. Also, there's so commonly someone who has chemotherapy performed on them, they can develop something known as neutropenic fever. It's when a specific type of white blood cell is very low and you have a fever. It's a very dangerous situation. Broad spectrum antibiotics, meaning antibiotics that cover a whole host of different uh, bacteria need to be given right away in order to prevent the person from dying because their immune system isn't capable in dealing with the bacteria on its own. So I think this is a pretty interesting case already and I've just seen like five seconds of it. There's some vomiting, there's no blood in it. Last chemo was a week ago. Hey. You're here. Very accurate presentation so far. Knowing when the last chemo treatment's very important when uh, judging what the next step of the treatment plan is. I'm scared. Ah, you're running a fever. Just another infection. Chemo's still crushing your immune system. I'll get you started on broad spectrum antibiotics again. Acetaminophen to get your fever down. If you cultures from both arms, urine, she'll need a head CT. Okay. Don't worry. We'll get this under control, get you both back home soon. Having a good rapport with patients like that is very important. Nurses and some doctors and even people that are just spending time in the hospital for a short period of time are very somber when they're around sick people, especially chronically sick people who've been sick for a long period of time. But in reality, they would love for someone to come in with a little more lighthearted approach, can laugh with them, make them smile. I'll always try and have a laugh with them, tell some jokes, especially if I know the family well. And I think that makes um, a very unpleasant experience a little bit more bearable. That's just my take on it. How'd you get that cheeseburger, Chad? Delivery app. <laughs> it looks like you haven't been following your diet. Diet's not work. Have you been taking your insulin? I don't want to lick your neck. What? I'm here because my toe's killing me. Mm. Severe gangrene. 
So a gangrenous, this is really gross. A gangrenous toe could be so infected and dead. Uh, it's basically necrotic. That means dead tissue that it can fall off like that. Obviously it's a little exaggerated. The smell is probably the worst part of all of it because the bacteria, once they eat your tissue, they release a very foul smell. It will light up the entire room. I'm not talking about you have to sniff the wound. As soon as you walk into the room and there's gangrene present, you're gonna smell it. That is very true. <laughs> New admission, 21 year old girl, history of IV drug use, likely endo. She was trying to steal that lot and now she wants to leave AMA. She's been spiking fever, vomiting. She's using again, she hey, took all my money. And put it on all Those who um, use uh, drugs, especially injection drugs, they're predisposed to a whole host of illnesses. So this is a common presentation, unfortunately, especially in light of the opioid epidemic that's going on right now. When you inject into your body anything, especially in a non-sterile technique, meaning the needle isn't clean, your skin isn't clean, you're more predisposed to things like meningitis, endocarditis, Meningitis. meningitis is an infection of the pads surrounding the brain. Endocarditis is infection of the heart valves. These are life-threatening illnesses that can make you act this way because bacteria is festering in your body. And unless it's treated quickly and correctly, you can die. And that's just talking about infection. Think about all the other things that could be going on. When you're under the influence of drugs, it's very possible that you're acting this way as a result of an overdose from simply the drug. When a patient comes into the emergency room and they're presenting with this kind of outcry, screaming, what we call altered mental status, AMS. We have to figure out, is it related to the drugs? Is it because of infection? Is it something more sinister? Uh, has this patient had a seizure? There's a lot of things that are happening simultaneously in the doctor's mind, so it's not an easy situation to deal with, but ER doctors are the front line in dealing with this, and then once the patient is stabilized and ready to be admitted into the hospital, it then goes to internal medicine doctors like this gentleman or family medicine doctors like myself. If you walk out of here without any antibiotics, this will kill you. If you give us a chance, we can save your life. I'll stay if you give me three milligrams of Dilaudid. Two, if you calm down. I can't say what he's doing is wrong because she's likely withdrawing from dilaudid or opioids or heroin, whatever it may be. In order to help her condition, it's possible that you need to taper her off, meaning give her smaller and smaller doses, more spaced apart of the same chemical that she normally gets high on. Plus, if it's gonna make her reconsider and stay and get treated with antibiotics for her endocarditis, you're saving her life. Some people may disagree with his approach and say, absolutely not, she's not getting dilaudid. Some will say that there is a medical benefit. So that's why practicing medicine is an art. It's not a science because two doctors can look at the same situation and have different approaches for solving it. I understand what he's doing and I sort of respect it. Oh. Baby! Get a crash cart. Come with oh, baby. I'm not getting a pulse. Code blue and ED alpha. Get out, out of here. <laughs> Someone falls and they have no pulse. You call for help and without even thinking about it, you're pumping on the chest, chest compressions. Chest compressions save lives. I've said it before, chest compressions, I'm gonna say it one more time. Chest compressions is the first thing you do. Even if you have no training in it, start pumping on the chest. You're running the code. I've never run a code. Do you want an amp of bicarb? He's in charge. Page anesthesia. <laughs> When you're running a code blue, you're following the advanced cardiac life support algorithm. It's literally written out for you. You give each person a role, you do chest compressions, you monitor the medications, you monitor the time, you monitor the rhythm, and everybody has roles. After that, there is a specific algorithm. You literally follow steps on little cards that you can carry in your pocket of, when to recheck the rhythm, what medications to give, what options of medications do you have, what dosage. What is the first question you ask in the code? Rhythm. What's the rhythm? PEA. PEA is pulseless electrical activity. It basically means the heart has a rhythm, but you do not feel a pulse. There's some electricity going through the heart, but it's useless because it's not creating enough uh, of a muscular motion in, within the heart to create a pulse to make the heart beat. PEA is not a shockable rhythm, meaning you do not use the paddles for that. You use epinephrine, you use drugs, you use chest compressions, and you hope to get the patient back, and you wait for the rhythm to change into one of the two shockable rhythms. Should we shock? No, we can't. The rhythm's not shockable. Get me one of Epi, make those compressions harder faster. Prepare to innovate. 
So when you're doing chest compressions, you wanna make sure you're doing quality chest compressions. You wanna push at least two inches deep into the chest, which sometimes can break ribs. It's a horrible sound to hear, but you're doing this to help resuscitate the patient, basically bring them back to life. So if on the off chance you break a rib, that's okay. It does happen in elderly folks much more than in young folks. You also wanna do it to at least 100 beats per minute. So if you think there's 60 seconds in a minute, you're pushing a little bit faster than once per second. A good way to sort of monitor if you're doing it right is to sing the song in your head, please, staying alive, because that does go to about 100 beats per minute. It's the classic way that we're taught. <gasps> <laughs> Funny that it's called staying alive and we're trying to bring someone back to life, but that's some of that uh, raw medical edgy humor. <laughs> it's been 24 minutes, it's time to call the code. No! This is my code, you gave me this code. Okay, start the cooling protocol for mental status. Oh, who are we gonna pulse? You saved our life. Doing a code on a young person for 20 minutes is not unrealistic. Also not unrealistic to recommend stopping the code because the brain without oxygen for 24 minutes is obviously very dangerous. And even again, even if you bring the pulse back, will the brain work again? You won't even know until the person wakes up. The first line that one of the other residents tells them is you saved her life. In reality, that could be a great thing. But also on the other hand, it could also be an awful thing because she may just need to be on a, a, a ventilator for the rest of her life, functionally brain dead, just her heart beating and her lungs working because she's on a machine. So. Very difficult situation to find yourself in. You came in here all bright eyed and bushy tails ready to save lives, but today you didn't save a life. You saved a brainstem because you didn't listen to me. Did he do the wrong thing? Not necessarily. In this situation, it, especially because her family looked like they were there, this is a time to have a conversation with the family very quickly and explain to them what's going on, explain the consequences of, hey, if we bring her back at this point 20 minutes in, she could, could come back. Uh, with a pulse, but also be brain dead and help them decide what to do in the situation. Allow them to make the decision because you know, they're her next living kin. Some hospitals have a cooling procedure that when someone undergoes uh, either a heart attack or uh, a sudden stoppage of the heart like she did, that they cool the body down, which slows the metabolic rate, which can help the brain survive a little bit longer. So this doesn't always hold true. Don't use this as an application for your own life or making decisions for your family's life. Treat each situation on its own. Talk to the doctors in front of you and make the best decision that you can with the information given to you at the time. What was rule one, then? Do whatever you tell me to do. No questions asked. All we wanna do is help our patients, but what they don't teach us in medical school is there are so many ways to do harm. The first job of a doctor is not to heal, it's to first do no harm. Because if you look at the history of doctors in the past, we've made a lot of mistakes, over treating patients, under treating patients, deciding what's right for our patients and going against their own wishes. I think we've done a lot better in recent years, but there's still plenty of room to go to improve. If it were easy, everyone would be a doctor because this is the best job in the world despite everything because of everything. There you have it, The Resident, season one, episode one in the books. Initial impression, um, this show's absolutely ridiculous. This resident, while he's, you know, smart and has some experiences, he just does some crazy things. He's a cowboy in my eyes, uh, deciding who lives and who dies. I'll say the way that they're talking about medicine is accurate. Some of the medical terms that they use are used accurately. The procedures, Eh, somewhere in the middle 50-50 of their accuracy. I think it's gonna make for a fun show. I definitely relate more to this show because it's more internal medicine and I'm family medicine, so I practice a lot of internal medicine on my own as compared to Grey's Anatomy, which is a surgical show and I'm less of a surgeon. I like watching all medical shows. So if you have a show you want me to watch or an episode of this show or any other show, drop it down below in the comments. And again, the most important thing you can do to help this channel grow and get yourself more content, 
and better content is to subscribe. And not just subscribe, but click that little bell on the bottom to make sure you get notifications when my video first comes out. As always, stay happy and healthy.